scene queens, the e-girls of the 2000s? These are emo scene kids, but if you're over 25, you've probably never heard of them. Welcome to A Study of Style, the series on this channel where we take a look at a specific fashion aesthetic and do our best to break it down. In today's episode, we'll be examining the scene subculture, and more specifically, the rise of scene queens. We'll be doing a deep dive into what scene is, how it came to be, its recent resurgence in popularity, as well as its identifying features. Let's get into it. Unlike other subjects we've covered on the channel thus far, scene was much more than a fashion aesthetic. It was an entire subculture that branched out into music, social media, and even food. Like many alternative groups, scene's beginnings were as a non-conformist movement. With the counterculture starting as an offshoot of the pre-existing emo subculture that had become popular in the mid-90s. Much like emo, the scene movement began with music, with the genres of crunkcore and neon pop punk being widely influential and somewhat indicative of the aesthetic as a whole. The significance of the scene subculture eventually led to the mainstream popularity of the musical groups that were associated with it. Many of these groups gained recognition via the then up-and-coming website, MySpace, which was the leading social media network site not only for tweens and teens in general, but was popular amongst scene kids especially. In the early 2000s, there were an assortment of social media sites that people would use to keep in touch with friends or meet new people, with Friendster and LiveJournal being two platforms that would eventually have its user base swallowed up by the juggernaut that was MySpace. Founded in August 2003, the site started off slowly enough, but by 2005, it was the largest social networking site in the world with more than 100 million users per month. Many icons of the scene subculture, whether it was musicians or models, have attributed much of their popularity and success to the platform. Scene queen legend Hannah Beth said about the switch to MySpace, quote, I first heard about MySpace when I was in high school. I was either 15 or 16 years old, and I just remember people talking like, yeah, there's this new platform. Back when it first started, there weren't many people on it, so it was mostly people that were in your area and into the same things you are. I was super into the whole emo vibe, so that's when I got on it. Back then, being an influencer wasn't a thing. I would find anyone that was a photographer and meet up with them offline, which probably wasn't safe, but I survived. I always styled my own shoots and people were always into my weird fashion and makeup. That's how I got a lot of my followers. I had a hard time meeting people I could relate to in real life. But with MySpace, I was able to meet all of these people that I could relate to, and who were into the same things I was. It was a whole new world for me. Interestingly, MySpace was so tied to the rise and spread of the scene aesthetic that the site's downturn in popularity in 2009 has been cited as the leading cause for the death of scene, with the aesthetic's relevance eventually being replaced by Tumblr hipsters. When the scene movement first started popping off, there were many women who gained notoriety on MySpace for seemingly exemplifying the look, and they were referred to as scene queens. This moniker referred to the likes of Lexi Lush, Audrey Kitching, and Vanna Venom, to name a few, who became the faces of the scene movement with girls all over the world envying their style. Hannah Beth said of the moniker and fame, quote, I didn't hear the term scene queen until I was 17 or 18. I was with Audrey and we were doing a lot of events with this company called Buzznet. We did warp tour together, we had poster signings and things like that. And I just remember the girls being like, oh my god, I look up to you guys, you're like the scene queens. We'd wear tutus and crowns and this messy makeup and we were always doing these silly shoots, but then it became a whole movement that I didn't even realize was happening. Scene queens are one of the earliest examples of internet celebrities, people that we might now refer to as influencers. But in a world of Paris Hilton's, scene queens were the alternative it girls. They were the ones who didn't conform. They were utterly unique. And their rise in popularity was the culmination of the early 2000s obsession with celebrities and the introduction of the internet. The scene look is one that can be broken down in quite a few ways. Most simplistically, as neon emos, sharing many of the same fashion attributes like skinny jeans, black eyeliner, studded belts, and straight ironed hair. But if we break the aesthetic down further, we can actually spot some other interesting influences that led to the unique scene look. One that is notable and yet rarely discussed is the Japanese gyaru fashion subculture, which saw a spike in popularity in the 90s and early 2000s. 
The subculture was considered to be a rebellion against Japanese standards of society and beauty, a time when women were expected to be housewives and fit Asian beauty standards of pale skin and dark hair. As a result, those participating in gyaru fashion went the opposite direction, with some citing its inspirations as American pop culture, the valley girl archetype specifically, hence the tanned skin, blonde hair, blue contacts, and revealing clothing. Gyaru fashion had an incredibly wide range, with numerous subcategories that committed to different styles and looks. The scene subculture included many aesthetic choices that were present in gyaru fashion, including large hair, layered clothes, and bold colors. Combine gyaru with aspects of British punk and the already popular emo aesthetic, and you've essentially got scene style. Now, let's take a look at specific things that epitomized the aesthetic and were seen must-haves. Obviously, we can't mention everything, so think of this as the essentials if you were interested in participating in the scene aesthetic. Teased hair. The look distinctive. Hair that covers one part of the eye. Hair, straight or modified mohawks. Multicolored hair, the spike. Aside from dyeing and straightening your hair to the point it threatened to snap off with a light breeze, a key aspect of the scene kid look was incredibly teased hair that needed an entire can of hairspray to stay in place. Combined with sharp side bangs that covered one or both eyes, scene hair was as intimidating as it was gravity defying. Both the gyaru and punk influences are obvious here. Wacky dye jobs. Colored hair was hardly experimental when it came to the scene subculture. In fact, it was the standard. So if you wanted to try something more risque, you had to get colorful streaks or striped highlights, colloquially referred to as coontails, or for those with artistic talents, cheetah spots. Of course, as a result of all the excessive dyeing, straightening, and teasing, most scene teens didn't have the healthiest hair, so it was quite common to use extensions to achieve the look if necessary. Excessive eyeliner. Much like emos, scene kids of any gender would wear heavy amounts of black eyeliner that would astound parents and make them say you looked like a panda or a raccoon. To dress up the look, bright eyeshadow and thick eyelashes would be worn, creating a doll-like look. With so much emphasis on the eyes, the original scene queens rarely wore lipstick, something that has changed with more modern interpretations of the aesthetic. Piercings Stemming from its punk and emo influences, many scene kids had piercing styles that were considered more alternative and rebellious, a tactic used to scare off conservative parents, something scene kids relished in. Common piercings ranged from snake bites to nose rings, and of course, gauges. Skinny jeans. Boys wear their band shirts tight and pants even tighter. They wear girl pants. Yes, girl pants are a must. Can you bend over comfortably in them? <laughs> in opposition to boot cut jeans, which were considered the norm at the time, scene kids took inspiration from the 1980s and hopped on the skinny jean bandwagon long before the rest of us did. These skinnier jeans were worn by both men and women involved in the scene subculture, playing into the androgynous style that was also present in emo. And with colors ranging from black to bubblegum pink to neon green, skinny jeans were must-haves for any scene kid. Tutus Regularly worn by popular scene queens, the colorful tulle skirts were one of the rare instances when the scene silhouette wasn't straight up and down. T-shirts Scenesters practically lived in graphic tees, and the cheesier, the better. Oftentimes, they would wear children's shirts as they included the color palette and cute factor that the scene look relied on. A graphic tee, a neon tiger print hoodie, skinny jeans, and Converse were essentially the scene kid's starter pack. Stockings Underneath tutus or jean shorts, scenesters would often wear stockings, especially in colder weather. Fishnets were a staple, but like many aspects of scene style, going for bright colors was also a solid option, resulting in a look that could be seen as an ode to certain styles from the 1980s. Knee-high Converse Converse were a mainstay of 2000s fashion, but they completely dominated the scene subculture and were no doubt many scene kids' shoe of choice. Although both low and high top Converse could be worn, the concept of more is more won out in the end, and the coolest versions of the shoe were undoubtedly the knee-high ones. First made in the US during the 1980s, the shoe was revived in 2003 by Converse where they immediately found an audience. Back in the day, 80s punk rockers had a penchant for knee-high combat boots. These were essentially the 2000s version of that. 
Sanrio. As previously mentioned, the scene subculture seemed to have been influenced from Japanese garu style, and it continued to use Japan as inspiration by incorporating one of the country's most iconic characters into its aesthetic, Hello Kitty. With her iconic bow, she was only a pair of converse away from being a scene queen herself. Monster. Yes, an energy drink was an accessory back in the day. Not only would you ignore water for the sugary beverage, but you'd do your best to match it to your outfit. And as if that wasn't enough, you'd also pop the tabs off and turn them into jewelry. Candy. It's no surprise that aspects of other music subcultures would find their way into the scene space, with quite a few style influences coming from rave culture or cyber goths. Beaded accessories, also known as candy, were one-of-a-kind priceless items that were exchanged at raves amongst those within the community. A large part of the scene subculture, at least later on, was something that could only be described as random, an energetic form of manufactured quirkiness. As such, candy being a wholly unique item was the perfect accessory. Other items that were similarly taken from raver fashion included fluffies, a furry leg warmer, and animal hoods. Rubber bracelets. You may recall the jelly bracelet scandal of the early 2000s, but these were slightly different in execution. Now featuring a wider band with writing on it, they would sometimes have a band's name on them, or other times it'd be seen approved slogans like RAR or I Heart Boobies. The key to these was stacking as many as you possibly could on your arm, effectively creating a bracelet sleeve. Arm warmers. Both emo and scene kids unfortunately developed the reputation for self-harming, even if there was no real reasoning behind the stereotype aside from the fact that they were alternative and wore black. Arm warmers unfortunately exasperated the rumors as they made it look like one might be hiding scars, but realistically, they were just to keep people warm. Hair bows. This is the scene trend that is most clearly inspired by Japanese gyaru style, with the large bows becoming mainstays of that style long before scene was around. There are a few theories as to why bows became scene queen mainstays, but my theory is that one, it added a touch of femininity and cuteness to what was otherwise a masculine and daunting look, and two, with hair so big you needed something to balance out the look that actually had a chance of being seen. Tiaras. An interesting aspect of the scene aesthetic was how women were presented and dressed, either leaning towards a not-like-other-girls androgyny or dressing like alternative caricatures of ditzy bimbos. Because of the latter, plastic crowns became common accessories for scene queens, leading to their other nickname, MySpace Princesses. Shutter Shades Famously worn by Kanye West, this late 2000s trend was a staple wardrobe item for crunk core music artists, and as a result they trickled into the scene aesthetic, matching the neon colors that eventually grew to dominate the look. Studded belts A staple of the scene look were studded belts that could be worn with jeans, dresses, or over tutus. Never tucked into their belt loops, they would sit on the wearer's hips at an angle, with some people even wearing multiple at one time. Bright colors Although they stayed true to their emo roots, often incorporating black into their wardrobe, a key aspect of the scene aesthetic was its overutilization of color, with neons being especially popular. Animal print. Leopard, cheetah, and tiger print were incredibly popular patterns on scene clothing, and combined with the neon colors that dominated the aesthetic, it'd be impossible to not mention the similarity to Lisa Frank. Although the scene subculture was thought to have died in the early 2010s as a result of MySpace's downfall and the rise of other subcultures like swag, hipsters, or hype beasts, it's already made a comeback, albeit a small one, online. Referred to as the Roaring Twenties, teens who weren't around for the initial craze back in the 2000s have started dressing in the scene style once again. While they do incorporate some modern elements like crop tops or better makeup, for the most part they look near identical to their predecessors, something we also saw in the Twilight Core aesthetic. For those who lived through the scene movement the first time around, it may be jarring to see it make a return so soon, but it's an easily explainable phenomenon. In recent years, many early 2000s trends have made a serious comeback, with things like one-shoulder tops, platform flip-flops, and low-rise jeans trickling into mainstream fashion. With so many teens gravitating towards 2000s fashion, it's inevitable that even alternatives would fall victim to the trend cycle, leading them to the obvious point of reference that is seen. 
No matter how hard you try, it's difficult to be truly and wholly unique. Even scene itself had its inspirations. This is also why alternative fashions of earlier years, say e-girls of the late 2010s, had a look that was also inspired by the minimalism of that era combined with trends from the 90s, a period of time that the late 2010s took inspiration from. I also think a large part of the aesthetic's resurgence has to do with the pandemic, and how the aesthetic is more adventurous, experimental, and somewhat apocalyptic in comparison to others like Cottagecore or The Coconut Girl. In a way, it appeals to our innate nihilism and pessimism and desire for rebellion. Young people, especially teens, are always going to feel like outcasts in one way or another. And for some people, the best way to work through those complex emotions is to find a like-minded community of outcasts and bond there, even if it means frying your hair. Although I wouldn't personally dress this way, I'm all for the Gen Z scene revival, especially because it's resulted in a far more diverse community than it had originally. What are your thoughts on the scene revival? And did you ever dress like that? I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you soon. Bye.